Greetings to each of you this day. As always, as we worship, I am praying that the Holy Spirit is moving in such a way to help us to feel that we've experienced God's presence. Because that's truly what we need, isn't it? I mean, we need to know that God is active in our lives in such a way that um, it inspires us. It does something within us to want to, to please our Lord and Savior. So as always, I hope and pray that each of us will turn our hearts to Him and seek Him even during this time of study. Well, as we look at this text, and as I studied this text this week, I was led to something that reminded me of my past. I grew up on, on the ball fields and, and the courts. I played basketball. I played baseball, I played football, but mostly I played baseball. Over there in Little Creek Amphibious Base, we played right there, played against the beach teams, and I spent so many hours over there on the ball field. And I was thinking about this sermon, the term squeeze play came to mind. Are you familiar with that term in in baseball? And I was thinking of it and you may have your own definition, but I was thinking of it as when you have a runner on third and they're coming home and the batter has to turn around and bunt. And Hal reminded me that that's called the suicide squeeze play. And so these terms that I haven't heard probably since 1986 were just, you know, going around in my mind. And it was interesting to travel back just a little bit. And then as I continued to study the text, I wanted to incorporate that into it. I wanted to share a a baseball diamond as a guide to travel through the text. So I've done some work on PowerPoint and created a baseball field. It may not be the perfect baseball field, but it is a diamond, and I think it will help illustrate the points that I, I want to make. But let me continue a little bit for the introduction in 1 John. Part of of what 1 John is doing is it is creating an argument against some of the opponents that they were facing. Now, part of what they were facing in the early church is a group called Docetism. Now, Docetism is a group of people that were claiming that Jesus was not fully human. They were saying that it just appeared as if he is human. So therefore, any pain that he experienced, um, the temptation story, all of that would have um, an impact because if he is not fully human, how does he identify with the people that he's coming to save? And so they're making the argument in this text that Jesus is fully human and he's also too fully God, that both of them exist within who Jesus Christ is. At my first church I served at Antioch, a delightful family. I still think so highly of them, even though I I don't hear from them often. They have two children that are now in high school and in college. But when I was at the church there, they were children, and they're both diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. With cystic fibrosis, they had to receive treatments every night before they went to bed. Um, where their, their lungs needed some extra help to function properly. I remember going over there. I went to the Christian bookstore, and I, was, um, I purchased a book to sit down and talk with them about asking them what it's like to have cystic fibrosis. And so I went and I sat over there, and we went through the book, and, and they explained to me how hard it was every night to have that treatment and have to be cautious all the time of colds or anything like that. Well, some time had passed by, and the theological question they had came forth. They said, Pastor, why did Jesus have to come in human form? Why did he have to do that? And it made so much sense to me, I could say to them, he wanted to identify with our pain and go through the experiences that we go through. And those two little children claimed that, and said, our Lord, our God, knows what it's like to go through pain 
and perhaps can even identify with my struggle. Now, that's a pretty powerful thing, isn't it, to know that because Jesus was fully human, he can identify with our struggles. He is empathetic to them because of that. All right, we're going to go to home plate first. Now, home plate is just going to be faith. I just labeled that faith. And in 1 John 1, 1 through 5, I have come up with four things that I want to share with you about faith. As found in these five verses. First of all, the word of life is a vital part of faith. In the Gospel of John, it talks about the Word of God. And here in 1 John, it also too uses the Word, but the Word of life. This being that Jesus Christ did indeed arrive in a mysterious way through the Holy Spirit's work and Mary's participation. He was born a human baby He is the incarnate Word. He is God in the flesh. And the Word of life arrived here on earth. And so He is the Word of life. Jesus Christ did arrive. He did come in history. God decided, I'm going to help these human beings out. And He sent Jesus Christ, right? He is the incarnate life. But also, too... He is the theme of life. The people are talking about the witness of Jesus Christ. They had heard Him. They had seen Him. They could touch Him. They were with Him. We can look to Jesus Christ and we can see the things of God revealed in Him, can't we? So He is the theme of life. He reveals what God's purposes are here On this earth. And we see that in him. Now here comes a very important one. That is mentioned as well. He is eternal life. He reveals to us. That there is an eternal plan from the father. Doesn't he? I mean without him revealing it. Would we know for sure? But he comes. And he reveals that there is an eternal plan. From the Father that people can participate in. So he reveals that plan to us. And lastly, if you consider the first three, he shows us that there is a joyful life. (laughs) Even beyond our circumstances. Because... He arrived because He has showed us how to live, because we have the promise of eternal life. Something should be stirring up in us that is joy-filled. So we as Christians should have a joy-filled life. Now these are just four elements that are listed in this text that show us what faith is about. And the, the theme that follows through all four of them is life and love. The love of God. It follows throughout that whole journey. Well, we're at home base. Everyone has life. They arrive, right? If you arrive into the world, you have life. Now let's talk about a little bit of the details of traveling through what Jesus Christ has done for us. So let's go to first base. Now, on first base, I have labeled that forgiveness. I don't know if you can see the text box in there in the brown, but it talks about Christ purifies. In other words, Christ cleanses. You see, part of the reason the Father sent the Son is because He desires union with us, but there is something that prevents that. We arrive into the world and we participate in something called sin. And we are defiled, aren't we? I mean, each of us. No one is exempt from it. So we are defiled by sin. Now the scripture says that God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. But sin is categorized in the shadow category, is it not? That those are the things not of God. So there has to be a method. There has to be a way to deal with that darkness. 
And so Jesus Christ, he, God loves us so much that he sent his son. He sent his son. And the light of the world, Jesus Christ, works in the harmony with the love of God. And what it does, it reveals to us the plan that he has for us. And so in that plan and in this text, it says that the blood of Jesus Christ is the thing that purifies us from the defilement that we have within ourselves and creates separation from us and God. But it says, when we trust in that blood of Christ. Now, the interesting thing about the blood of Christ, this word purify or cleanse, it's written in the present tense. That means it's ongoing. It's active. It's ongoing. And so people in the world still have the availability to participate in it. And so through the blood of Christ, that is the way that we receive forgiveness. That is the way union is made between a human, humanity, and God himself. It's through the blood and the power of Christ. I started studying this. I couldn't help but I was saying, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. I just couldn't stop. It just came. Because there is a power, isn't it? It removes the defilement. It makes us presentable to a God that has no darkness, has no shadow. So Christ purifies. God sent his son that we may be purified. Does it stop with that sort of thing, with salvation, with coming to God? Sometimes I see and I experience people get on a spiritual high. They have come to the Lord and, and they've given their heart. And they've received that union, that forgiveness of sin. And then it kind of fizzles out. Sometimes that happens, doesn't it? But here in, in 1 John, as we continue, we're going to move to second base. And on second base, I want to put formation there. Formation. And in the formation, God, Christ is producing something. You see, after you have been forgiven, after we have been forgiven... The work of God does not stop. It is ongoing in such a way that it is still trying to produce something. But the text says that if we think that we are without sin, we have deceived ourselves. Even if you are saved, it is a misunderstanding to think that you're not going to sin again. Because the fact is, we are still human. We are in the state of forgiveness. But we are not embodying it as we are humans. Does that make sense? We are forgiven, but we still are people that continue to make mistakes and learn and grow. But the power of the Lord meets us right where we're at. And it's trying to produce something incredible. It's trying to form something within us that's very powerful. And so the text talks about this very important thing that we should do to help form the things of Christ in us. It says, as we continue to sin, because we will sin, it says that because God is faithful and just, because this is the character of the Lord. It says that confession is possible. Confession is possible. So yes, we have that time where we come to salvation. But I believe in the forming of who we are that there is an ongoing confession that is happening. Lord, I've missed the mark. Lord, I should have acted there, but I didn't. Lord, I said the wrong thing again. I don't know about you, but I want something of God to be formed in my life. I am thankful for salvation, but I want something more. I want to experience that ongoing blood. So when I confess, I can look back to first base and I can say the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is still active in my life now. I can say, Lord, please forgive me. And that union with God is restored at higher and higher levels. Even, even King David 
was one after the, after the Lord's heart. And I believe that had something to do with the repentant nature over and over again. My friends, if you're feeling distant from God today, or if you're feeling like the union is not what it should be, perhaps confession is the tool, the spiritual tool that's used to draw us back near to the heart of God. It's ongoing, isn't it? I mean, as long as you're alive, you're going to be making mistakes. <laughs> you're going to be tempted. But the power is God is always ready to forgive. Now, that's a wonderful God, isn't it? Does it matter how far away you are from him? Absolutely not. You just call upon it. He's willing to forgive and restore because he loves us so deeply. And his light is working in such a way in harmony with his love. His light shines on us. And additionally, his love is put out in the world. So they are working in such a way that we too may imitate Jesus Christ. Well, let's travel on to third base. Anybody hit a triple? Anybody hit a double? You made it. You got that down. Salvation, ongoing formation. Third base is fellowship, right? And in the, in the fellowship, Christ pleasing. Christ pleasing. In verse 10 in this text, it says that we, if we did, if we think that we are perfect and not sinful um, and our actions reflect that, it says something pretty powerful. It says that we can call God a what? A liar. We can make God out to be a liar. Do our actions matter? Absolutely. I don't know about you, but I have a deep desire to continue that fellowship, that union with God. Now, I think in that union, God has already blessed me beyond compare. I have received showers of blessings beyond compare in my life. I mean, I just feel like I'm blessed. I'm up here before you today. I'm blessed. But at the same time, because there's fellowship, I know I can go on my knees and say, Lord, what about this? Lord, can you show me can you show me how to work through this? Even in that conversation, the Lord might say, Brian, I want you to do this. And guess what? I have a response to that. I can say, yes, Lord. I can say, no, Lord. Or I can say, maybe. What would be the appropriate response? I'll get back with you, Lord. <laughs> show me, Lord. In that deep union fellowship with God, I believe our actions matter and we don't want to make him out to be a liar. So I think the answer is, if you know that it is God, the only answer is, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because I cherish this fellowship with you so deeply, I can't do anything but what you're calling me to do. Fellowship with God Almighty. Now let's bring it on home. Let's bring it on home. God's purposes. We see those purposes, or let's say Christ's purposes. Christ's purposes, we see those purposes as we are, as we are coming home. What type of news are we called to share with people? We call it evangelism. What type of news is it? Good news. There is good news. The Father has sent His Son and the Son has come. There's good news to share. So we are called, right? And God's purpose is to share that good news. Now, is that all by word? You're going to go up and down London Boulevard. There's good news. <laughs> Stand with a sign. Or are you going to let it just flow out of who you are? Your cup overfloweth with the good things of God to the fact that when people encounter you, they know that you have experienced something and good news is being shared even in the interpersonal relationships. Jesus Christ, in his purposes, he comes to say, the kingdom of God has arrived. And because I'm the risen Lord, it's available to you. His purposes, they're all around us. So we come into home plate and we come back to faith. And I want to share with you that 
I believe something of this process is happening constantly. It's happening constantly in the world. And I had a little vision, you know, if, if each of us had our own ball field, we might say where we're at on the, on the bases. But I started thinking about the power, the light of God, the love of God, and how powerful it is that all the people in the world where God is working, He's un- unveiling Himself. He is active. The blood of Jesus is ongoing. It's a powerful thing, isn't it? It's an amazing thing. I found that clip there in the middle. If you look where the pitcher's diamond is, or would be, I don't know if you could see that light shining through, but it's in the shape of a heart. God's light, God's love, are revealing the things of Jesus Christ and a reality here in this world where we experience so much The power, the light, the love of God is still active. It's still active, my friends. And I don't know if you can see behind the clip, but it's where we started off. The umpire's calling safe. He's going to get us home. He's always going to get us home. The, The squeeze play has already been put on. He died on the cross and he rose again. Evil does not have the power anymore. God Almighty does. The squeeze play was successful. And we participate in that wonderful act of God sending His Son. He loved us so much, He sent Him that we may have union with Him. I don't know where you're at on your journey today, but I just want to encourage you that the light and love of of God will reveal the way. It will reveal the way. It's ongoing and active. Find trust in it and know that you are safe in His wonderful arms. Would you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, We need to be reassured of your nearness. We need to have a sense of belonging not only to you, but to each other as a community. We pray, Lord. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our church. We pray for our community. We pray for your world. Lord, thank you for the ongoing power of the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, let it Let it stir within us and do all sorts of work. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, we come now to a time of commitment. And in this time of commitment, those of you that are in the pews, you already know the Lord. Just want you to reflect on where you're at in your journey. I mean, are you living in the forgiveness? Are the things of God being formed in you? Are you fellowshipping with the Lord? Is your faith resting in the promises of of Jesus Christ? But those of you that have not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, the power of the blood, the work of Jesus Christ is right there for you. Travel to first base. Receive it. Stand on the base with joy. The defilement is gone. Union has been made with a God that is all light. Respond as you feel led by God as we sing our hymn of commitment. It's out of my bondage, sorrow, and night. And make the commitment that the Lord is calling you to make this day.